It's 90 seconds to midnight. This was the announcement that was made January 23rd of this year. What was this announcement pertaining to? It was pertaining to the Doomsday Clock. The Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists leaves the hands of the Doomsday Clock unchanged due to trends that continue to point the world towards global catastrophe. Pronounce you, In 1990, the Doomsday Clock was set at 17 minutes to midnight. Why was there such a drastic change from 1990 to now? Many people feel that when the second hand of the doomsday clock reached midnight, that catastrophic events would take place that will cause the end of the world as we know it today. When the hands of the doomsday clock reach 12, midnight, does it mean that the world will end? The question that we should ask is, what is the end of the world? <clears throat> Many people fear that the end of the world will mean the destruction of the earth. There are many reasons that people fear that the earth will be destroyed. People fear things such as climate change, disease pandemic, extinction of critical species, or even nuclear war will be things that will bring destruction to the earth. Movies and TV shows have their own versions of things that can cause this world's end, such as the world being taken over by machines. All of this show that the end of the world has always been a concern of people. It was a concern of Jesus' disciples also. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew, the 24th chapter, and we'll read verse 3, and we'll read about the concern that Jesus' disciples had about the end of this system. Matthew 24 3 and it reads while he was sitting on the Mount of Olives the disciples approached him privately saying tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your presence and of the conclusion of the system of things from reading this scripture we see that Jesus disciples was concerned about the end as well What kind of things are people concerned about when it comes to the end? Many people fear that the earth will be totally depopulated or destroyed. The question is, is this the case? Will the end mean the destruction of the earth? To answer this question, let's look at our Bibles at the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 4, and we'll read what this scripture says will happen to the earth. That's Ecclesiastes 1, 4, and it reads, A generation is gone, and a generation is coming, but the earth remains forever. The earth remains forever. This scripture lets us know that the earth will not be destroyed or depopulated because verse 4 tells us that the earth remains forever. So since the earth won't be destroyed or depopulated, the question is, what will be destroyed? To get the short answer to that question, let's take a look at 2 Peter, the third chapter, and we'll read verse 7. 
That's 2 Peter 3, 7. And it reads, But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are reserved for fire and are being kept until the day of judgment and of the destruction of the ungodly people. 2 Peter 3, 7 tells us that ungodly people will be destroyed, not the earth. It says ungodly people are the ones that will be destroyed. The question is, how will God destroy this wicked world? What did Jehovah use in the past to destroy those who were wicked? One of the things that Jehovah used in the past to destroy those who are wicked is to turn them against each other. This was a strategy that he used at different times to deliver the Israelites from their enemies. This is a strategy that Jehovah used when the Israelites were being threatened by the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the inhabitants of the mountainous region of Seir. We can read about this in the book of 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter, verse 22 through 24. So let us turn there in our Bibles to 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter, and we will read about how Jehovah used this strategy to deliver his people from their enemies. 2 Chronicles 22, 20, 22 through 24 reads, When they began joyfully singing praises, Jehovah said, up an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and the mountainous region of Seir, who were invading Judah. Now listen to this point. And they struck each other down. And the Ammonites and the Moabites turned against the inhabitants of the mountainous region of Seir to destroy and annihilate them. And when they finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy one another. But when Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness and looked toward the crowd, there they saw their carcasses falling to the ground. There were no survivors. Jehovah used a strategy to wipe out this enemy coalition that gathered together to fight against his people Israel. And he was successful using this method because at the end of verse 24, we are told that there were no survivors. Jehovah turned this turned wicked ones against one another in the past. And this is something that will be used at the end of this system. How do we know this will happen? From youth up, mankind is geared towards violence. For example, in war torn countries, such as Afghanistan and Iraq. Children see weapons of war and the destruction that it caused right in their area. They are displaced with their families because of these wars. In China, young men are raised knowing that when they turn 18, they're going to automatically be fighting in the Chinese army. Those who choose not to go will go to prison. What about here in the United States? For years, violence has been a huge part of TV shows that are watched by children. Cartoons such as Bugs Bunny, Woody Woodpecker, and Tom and Jerry show characters getting hit with axes, getting shot by guns, getting hit with baseball bats, and the list goes on. What about our teenagers? Teenagers today love to play video games that feature violence. Games such as Grand Theft Auto, Mortal Kombat, and Call of Duty are some of these games. These games have very violent graphics that show real kills with the shedding of human blood. Have anyone ever heard of a game called Armor 3? 
Before this game was being marketed as a video game, this game was an actual combat simulation for the military, and now it's a game for our teenagers to enjoy. All this being said, this is show that violence is a learned behavior. Since violence is a learned behavior that people have learned since infancy, it doesn't make it hard for people to do the things that have, they have been taught, especially in times of turmoil. People use violence when they are in survival mode. When there is tribulation, People tend to go into survival mode and use whatever means they feel is necessary to survive, which makes it easier to commit violent acts because they want to survive. Especially when this is what they've learned all their lives. What other strategies would you hope to use against the ungodly at the time of the end? Jehovah will will the forces of nature to bring unrighteous ones to ruin. Let's turn to the book of Joel, chapter 38, and we'll read verses 22 and 23, and we will read about how Jehovah used these forces of nature. That's Joel 38, 22 and 23, and it reads, have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail? What is the purposes of snow and hail being in storehouses? Let's continue reading verse 23 where it says, Which I have reserved for the time of distress, for the day of battle and war. The purpose of these natural elements, such as snow and hail, being stored in storehouses is for war purposes. These elements are very powerful weapons. If anyone has ever been in a state where it snows, like when I live in Illinois or Minnesota, one snowstorm can immobilize several cities at one time. And what about hail? Hailstones can cause a lot of damage. It causes damage to houses and cars, things that have hard surfaces. So imagine what it can do to a human. Depending on the size of the hailstone, it can even kill a human. These forces of nature are very powerful weapons that will be used at the time of the end. The final strategy that Jehovah will use is his son, Jesus Christ, as his executioner, along with his heavenly forces. Jesus and his heavenly army of powerful spirit creatures will annihilate their earthly foes. Jehovah's heavenly forces will completely exterminate all evildoers. It will be impossible for people to hide from Jehovah's judgment. Have you ever heard the statement, you can run but you can't hide? People will run to whatever means of safety they feel will help them survive, but it will be futile because they won't be able to hide from Jehovah's execution. So since these are the methods that Jehovah will use to destroy ungodly people, the question that we must ask ourselves is, what must we do to survive. What must we do to survive Jehovah's Day of Judgment against the ungodly people? One of the things that we learn from our reading the Bible and as we learn lessons of history, the time that we live in was not the only time of the end. Noah also lived in the time that was the time of the end. This was a time where Jehovah's judgment was against the wicked ones of Noah's day, and only Noah and his family survived the end of that wicked system. 
How did Noah and his family survive the end of that wicked system? Why did Jehovah keep Noah and his family safe when he brought the flood on the world of ungodly people? Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Genesis, the sixth chapter, and we'll read verse 9. And in reading this scripture, we will see what helped Noah survive. That's Genesis 6, 9, and it reads, this is the history of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He proved himself faultless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with the true God. The reading of this scripture lets us know that Noah was a righteous man who walked with the true God. Noah walking with the true God don't mean that God somehow came to the earth and him and Noah took a walk together. Nor does it mean that Noah went to heaven and they took a walk. What it does mean is that Noah was a man devoted to Jehovah God. He was a righteous man who rejected the actions of all those who was in that world of ungodly people that was around him. The world that Noah lived in was a very violent world just like the one that we live in. During that time, angels left their original positions in heaven and came down here to the earth, and they took women as wives for themselves. These angels and the women had children who were hybrid offsprings that were giants. These hybrid offspring giants would bully other people taking whatever they want. They were so bad that if a man had a wife, they would take her. The earth at that time was filled with violence because the people was just as bad as the giants or Nephilim as they were called. So not only did you have the, that the dead world have wicked angels who left their proper dwelling place, it had their hybrid bully sons and evil wicked people who were violent to where the Bible to where it says in Genesis 6 5 that Jehovah saw that man's wickedness was great on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was bad all the time bad all the time means that the person would go to sleep with bad thoughts and wake up with bad thoughts Genesis 6 12 tells us that God looked upon the earth and it was ruined why? Because all flesh had ruined his way on earth. Noah, on the other hand, was a righteous man who avoided the corruption of the ungodly world around him. He measured up fully to what God required of him. To illustrate, let's put up the first picture and we will see what made Noah different. Looking at this picture, we see this Nephilim coming into his establishment, swinging his weight around, and looking like he's standing about 10 or 11 feet tall. He's towering over the tallest man out of the three guys next to him, who's possibly over six feet. This Nephilim was being a bully, throwing this cart of food that somebody was going to take home. Now, look at these three men who are ready to battle with this giant. They've armed themselves with clubs to handle business and fight this nephew. Looking further at this picture, we see another man with a stick in his hand. Help is on the way. He's joining in to battle this giant along with these other three men. Look at the people standing in the background with their fists raised in the air, fully engaged in the battle. And even one of Noah's sons is engaged in the battle with his fists in the air. Kind of reminds us today. Uh, kind of reminds us of today. People love to see a good fight. Look at Noah on the other hand, trying to direct his boys away from this atmosphere. He's not only trying to get his boys. The physical safety, 
but he's also trying to save them mentally, spiritually, by getting them away from this atmosphere so they don't develop these attitudes of the world. Noah was not only protecting his sons from this atmosphere, he was protecting himself as well. He did not allow the apathy of his contemporaries to influence him. Noah kept himself separate from the world around him. And like Noah, we must also keep ourselves separate from this world around us that will be destroyed. How can we do this? Just like Noah walked with the true God, we must also walk with the true God to hope. How did Noah walk with the true God? He did what Jehovah asked of him and enjoyed a close friendship with him. Noah exercised faith in Jehovah by building the ark. The question is, how did Noah show that he was exercising faith in Jehovah by building the ark? For the answer to that question, let us turn in our Bibles the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and we'll read verse 7. And as we're reading, we will see the faith of Noah exercised in Jehovah. That's Hebrews 11, 7. And it reads, By faith, Noah, after receiving divine warnings of the things not yet seen, this scripture mentions things not yet seen, because at that point it had never rained before. So no no one had ever seen rain. Let's continue where it says, showed godly fear and constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And through his faith, he condemned the world and he became an heir of the righteousness that results from faith. Can we, can we see the faith that Noah displayed by building the ark? He did not procrastinate or put off the building of the ark, even though he didn't know when the flood would come. Jehovah didn't give him a date as to when he would bring the flood, so Noah building the ark right away was an act of faith. What else was an act of faith in Noah's case? In 1 Peter 2 5, Noah was called a preacher of righteousness. Why was this? It was because when people would ask him, why are y'all building this big old building? Noah didn't hold back or tell them, go away and mind your own business. But he let the people know that Jehovah was bringing this, bringing in this flood and why he was flooding the earth and how getting on the ark that he was building was the only means of being saved. He also talked about why these things had to take place. And he said that all flesh had ruined itself on the earth, and the earth was filled with violence. Statements like this had to hit home to a lot of the people that Noah was talking to. Noah also instilled these sayings into his family as well. Let's take a look at the next picture. Now in this picture, Noah and his family are building the ark. You see the little boys that was in the last picture? They're all grown up now with beards like a lot of us. We can see how Noah's sons benefited from his protection in the last picture because they are right there with him building the ark. We also see their wives on the ground, helping out, bringing food, and doing a lot of things to help the family build this means of salvation. The sons have taught their wives the same thing that Noah taught them. Noah's sons, his wife, and their wives all exercised faith in Jehovah by building this ark and doing everything that building this ark entailed until it was finished. They all maintain strict obedience in building the ark, not taking shortcuts when constructing the ark, but building it exactly the way Jehovah told them, using the exact dimensions 
that they were instructed to use. Noah helped his family remain united in sacred service. Just like Noah, we too must also exercise faith, not putting off in our minds that this world is ended. We must also warn others that the end of all wickedness is coming. We are not building a literal ark like Noah and his family, but we are building something. We are building our relationship with Jehovah. How? By maintaining strict obedience to the instructions that Jehovah gives us. Just like Noah and his family, we put our faith in Jehovah, following his instructions to the T because we love him. The things that we do, like attending meetings every week at the Kingdom Hall and on Zoom, going into the ministry, going to assemblies and conventions, and personal study are what we do because we love Jehovah and we are obedient to him. And in this way, we build our figurative art with Jehovah. So we make the choice to do these things by which we can be saved. After doing these things that we need to do so that we can be saved, what do we have to look forward to after surviving the end of this world? Those who survive the end of this world will be happy. Let's look at Noah and his family once again. Imagine how happy and thankful Noah and his family were after they was preserved through the deluge. Think of how they must have felt when they opened the door to the ark, seeing that they were in a peaceful world. All evildoers were swept away in the deluge, so at that time, the earth only had righteous people because Noah and his family, servants of Jehovah, were the only ones on the earth. Let's take a look at the last picture. The door of the, dark, of the ark is opened. We see Noah and his family and the animals walking out of the ark in peace. They don't have to worry about the things that they had to worry about before the flood. No wicked angels materializing the people and taking women and marrying them. No Nephilim bullying people. No wicked, violent people running around committing murderous, violent acts. It was a time that they had, really had true peace. People who survived the end of this wicked world will have an opportunity to live in a world of peace. A world where violence and all the things that cause it will be done away with. All violent people will be gone. What about Satan and his demons? When this wicked world of people is destroyed, Satan and his demons will be locked away for a thousand years. They will not be around to influence the things that will happen in the new world. Our survivors of the destruction of this world will be truly happy. May we all be among the survivors of the end. Right in 30 minutes. Ooh, sure enough. <laughs>